Excellent. So this, this is the second time around we're running the course. Uh, we gained some experiences doing the course last semester, uh, but the course is still work in progress and it involves you participating in shaping and in, in running the course actually. Uh, because it is a relatively new course and it's a little bit, um, it's, it, it is a little bit um, important because it, it's in the transition between your the first uh, three semesters that you had towards the final year where you will be working on some specialization courses, some more advanced courses and your bachelor thesis. So it's kind of like a stepping stone course which transitions you from uh, being kind of a taught in a, in a more traditional way to being more independent and uh, searching for answers and, and kind of developing yourself as a programmer or as a developers, uh, you know, yourself. So we, we kind of working out how to, how to achieve that uh, well. Um, so as I'm saying, we're running the course for the second time. Uh, we will have the initial sessions done online. Uh, so the sessions are on Mondays and on Wednesdays. Um, I propose to have the Wednesday sessions uh, starting 15 minutes later and then running without a break. Uh, again, I am open for your feedback, whether that's, um, that's okay with you or, or you prefer starting 8.15 and having a 15 minutes break in the middle. Um, last year, we had both sessions starting morning and the majority of students preferred to just start 15 minutes later and run without a break. So if, if you just say in the comments again, if uh, you want a break or no break, so if you say no break, it means we're starting 8.30. Uh, uh, okay, that, there is a little bit more, uh, the start was a little bit more even. Um, yeah, that's a bit tricky to count. It's more of a uh, even spread. So I guess um, what we could do. So how about we do a comprom com compromise, compromise, and uh, have um, we will start. Um, let's start eight twenty and have ten minutes break. How about that? break yeah perfect so that's sorted um so as you see we will uh use uh gitlab and we will use the wiki on on the gitlab for most of the coordination uh, i will come back to that in in a moment so this will be the yeah the our usual zoom setup and most of the at least initial lectures will be done fully digital once we are allowed to run courses on campus, I will run uh, the course physically and, and record in Zoom. So we will have the Zoom always throughout the semester on with the recording. Uh, but if we are allowed to have sessions on uh, physically in, in campus, we will do that. Um, OK, so the logistics are sorted. There is one more important thing is that um, today you will have another um, another course um, called cloud computing, cloud cloud technologies um, at three o'clock, uh, which is run by Christopher, uh, and he and I collaborate in the beginning of the semester uh, in such a way that we join our sessions uh, and run uh, the first three sessions starting from Wednesday uh, collaboratively in such a way that you get an introduction to GoLang. Um, and because it is a little bit heavy for learning uh, two programming languages at the same time, we don't start this course until we sort of finish the Golang uh, block. Um, oops, so uh, if you bear with me, if we go to lectures, you will notice that we have today's session, uh, which is the introduction, and then the three consecutive sessions for this class for PROC uh, 2006, we will not have a class. Instead, we will have a joint sessions for Golang with uh, cloud computing courses, uh, cloud computing course uh, with Christopher. So uh, we will meet, I will meet with you in his session in PROC uh, 205 with his Zoom setup. 
uh, for the next three uh, sessions uh, starting on Wednesday. So Wednesday, eight o'clock, we don't have a session. We will have a session at 10 o'clock, I think. Uh, let me just quickly check the calendar. Um, so his, his classes are, um, yeah, so this one is mine. Yeah, so his, uh, he starts at 10, 15. So we will meet uh, on Wednesday at 10.15 for Golang. And then we will have three sessions related to Golang. Um, and we will not uh, have this course running instead uh, because um, his course has uh, data engineers and uh, uh, DICSEC students as well. So his class is like a superset. So it's kind of good to do it in, uh, in his time slot. Um, is it clear? Yeah, so you will join a, a cloud technology Zoom for that. Yeah, perfect. There was another. There was a question: Will the in-person lectures also be recorded and streamed? Yes, they will be recorded and streamed the same way as I'm doing it now from home. Uh, but I will do it from the lecture theater instead. Um, if you don't have the cloud subject, then please come for the sessions as if you had the cloud. Uh, so the uh, Golang part is relevant for this course as well. So even if you're not doing cloud technologies course, unless you've done it before or unless you know Golang, you don't have to attend. Uh, but if you don't know Golang, uh, I, I uh, recommend or advise you to attend the, the sessions as well. So I will post. Uh, I will post the details here. Uh, I will check with Christopher after today, uh, because he didn't announce the the Zoom links yet. He he will announce it at three o'clock to the, today. So I will post it in our um, uh, in our wiki. So I will put it uh, here and in the in the main uh, yeah and and here what is the uh, GoLang uh, Zoom link. Yes. So I will do that. Um, Yep. Okay. So that's more or less. Um, I will come back to the logistics a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Uh, those are the mo most important parts. Uh, so we are using a GitLab. We're not using. Um, we're not using Blackboard. I will possibly make some gl uh, global announcements using Blackboard if I want to be sure that everybody has uh, has been reached. Otherwise, we do announcements through the issue tracker. Uh, so in the issue tracker, you have um, uh, you have a certain um, labels and the labels. So if I you know try to create a new issue, um, we have um, we have uh, labels which we try to coordinate between the the various courses. And as Christopher will have similar, uh, and then the announcement is the one which I will use for making, you know, class announcements. Uh, but if there is something super important, I will double such that I will issue it in Blackboard as well. But other than that, we're not gonna use Blackboard. Um, the reason for not using Blackboard is that uh, you're not gonna use Blackboard after you graduate, and it's a bit useless skill. To be, you know, skilled in using Blackboard in an environment where you, as a developer uh, or as a professional, will never use Blackboard ever again, unless you become a teacher. Uh, so I don't really see a value of um, of using that tool if we can use another tool which, uh, you know, does the same job and some and and gives you an experience of uh, being a little bit more uh, developer oriented. Uh, so using an issue tracker instead and using a wiki. Uh, and GitLab and, um, and uh, Git repository is is more uh, educational in a sense than than spending time on fighting um, Blackboard. And Blackboard is not the most user friendly piece of software neither. So um, 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 yes, so it is uh, unfortunate that you will have to have. Uh, multiple exposures to different things. So in some courses you are using Blackboard and some courses we don't use Blackboard, uh, but that's, you know, th this is life of, uh, of programmers or uh, professionals. So um, I have to be on top of like 
five different messaging applications and different people and so on. And that, you know, that's part of life. Uh, so convenience, yes, that's a factor, but being able to deal with complexity and being able to be exposed and being efficient in different tools, that's, that's a skill that uh, we promote and we want you to get exposure to. So in some courses, we even use Jira. Uh, if you were to do a master degree with us, you would be exposed to yet another system like Jira and some other uh, project management software. And that's just part of, of life. Um, um, yeah, so Teams is another one. Um, yeah, if you, if you subscribe to this, you will get notifications every time there is a new issue. So that's quite convenient. Uh, but other, other than that, you can just check, like I'm checking uh, the issue tracker uh, myself, like what your feedback is and, and so on. So that works quite well in my, my workflow and it should be okay with you as well. Uh, similar setup will be in the cloud technology. So Christopher is also not using Blackboard. Uh, I, I'm not sure what Nipuna and uh, database cores will use. Uh, they may use Blackboard. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, but it, it's not such a big burden. And, and to be honest, we don't have too many announcements. We have just announcements about some lectures and some deadlines about the, um, the assignments and those will be published on the wiki anyway. So all the information will be kind of published here on top with the deadlines such that you can sort of check it and have it uh, handy. So if you bookmark the, the uh, project wiki, um, most information will be just directly here. Um, okay, so the other, yes. So the other thing is if you have uh, questions related to the course or if you have some su um, suggestions or uh, if you have some contributions, of course, you can use issue tracker. Uh, but if you have some just question uh, and um, which is easy to answer, we use Discord. So there is, um, there is, uh, I put the link somewhere. Yeah, um, I think it's in the course rules, maybe. No. Yes, here. So we have um, a student-run Discord server, and we as teachers have some channels there. Uh, and that um, that Discord server is quite uh, quite utilized for just chatting. Uh, so let me bring it up. So that's the one, and then we have. Um, yeah, there are some interesting programming discussions sometimes happening in that uh, channel. And then there is a PROC, um, PROC 206, and that's where I will double the announcements as well, such that if you uh, observe what's happening here and observe what's happening in the GitLab, then you will be on top of everything. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm most of the time available. So just uh, private message me or post a message on the PROC 206. So I'm very happy for you to get um interactive and to you know for you to ask questions so so do that um all right so i will come back to the logistics uh a little bit later uh what is what is the course about um Yeah, so Oscar says, if anyone has problems joining the Discord server, just send him a message, he will help you. Um, it's a good resource and it, it allows us to be kind of uh, in the loop for uh, Q&A or for anything. Christopher is also using it. And I know uh, many other lecturers are also using that, that server. So it's a good, um, good resource to get kind of uh, in touch, especially in the Corona times where you cannot pop into my office. Uh, normally, I would welcome you to pop in to A213 uh, and chat with me if you have some suggestions or problems or whatever. Uh, but because we kind of not in the office, then use please use the Discord. Um, all right, so let's do the fun part first. Um, I, I, I already covered some of the logistics, so that's... Uh, I was planning not to talk too much about logistics first, but, uh, it, you know, we ended up. So some simple questions for you. So um, 
what do you think the programmers use in their daily work the most? Good. How familiar are you guys with Git? Yeah, coffee is nice. <laughs> cool. Uh, I like your way of thinking. I really like that somebody mentioned brain. <laughs> so I think that's that's vi vital. Vital. Um, you know, uh, using your head and using your particular way of thinking. Uh, that's what makes a programmer a programmer. Um, so all of those are important. Uh, Git is sort of really nicely, uh, Git and Stack Overflow, yeah, <laughs> are nicely in the center. Uh, but it's all about you solving problems effectively. Uh, and to solve the problems, you have to use your head. So it's kind of similar to asking what writers use most in their work. Do they use their fingers and the typewriter or the text editor? Uh, not really. The novels are kind of happening in their heads. So they're using the head most, right? Um, OK, so uh, some questions in the Mentimeter are basically just uh, anonymous, but some are for you scoring points. So please join in. And when you're ready, we can start some um, more point-based quizzes. So 26, 27, we're missing some people. Come on, join in. One more. Excellent. All right, so let's do it. So is programming and coding synonymous? Is programming and coding the same? Yep, so this is a little bit tricky question. Um, the, the terms programming and coding are often used interchangeably. So they often used as if they mean the same thing. But if you look deeper into the, the, the theme, um, it is well established that uh, coding is a subset of programming. So programming is a kind of a broader term which covers more activities than coding. And coding is a kind of a subset of activities that the programmers do. Uh, so people who answered false um, kind of won some points, I guess. So they are often used interchangeably, but they are not the same. And I kind of mentioned a little bit what the differences are. So if you think about it, what do you think, like what, what would you associate with programming? So th this is more about this, this particular term. Um, yeah, nice. So problem solving, thinking, planning, uh, writing code, of course, you have to write some code. Uh, thinking about security, uh, what else, what do we have here, uh, automation. Um, yeah, when, <laughs> when I was a student, one of our lecturers said that uh, the, you know, the main job of a programmer is to make everything in such a way that the, programmer is only watching a progress bar. 
such that that's your job to sit and watch the progress bar and all the preparation and all the automation and everything related to that that's where you have to shine with your skills and then at the end of the day you are just watching progress bars uh, yeah that's really nice um crying yes it's painful uh especially if you're having some bugs which you cannot find um Okay, so that's that's programming. So what, how about calling? What's different? So how this word differs from the previous one? So coding was part of programming. Someone mentioned that you have to do coding for programming. Um, Yes, so you basically need to write code and you need to be familiar with the syntax and semantics of the language that you're using to write the code. Um, you may be solving some problems. So uh, writing code is not you know, automatic. Uh, if writing code was automatic, we would only have you know, uh, problem solving in an abstract way and all the software would be written automatically, but that, that's not real, right? We have to write the software as well. Um, so when writing code, you have to deal with some problems uh, related to the nature of the language or related to the compiler or related to the type system uh, or related to the kind of the tools that you're using, right? So it doesn't, it, it will not have anything to do with the domain. The domain and the problem solving in the domain is done in the kind of a programming space, programming umbrella. Whereas coding deals with the expressing what you've already solved abstractly in some concrete way, in a, some concrete syntax, right? Uh, and then some languages offer you certain facilities to do it more or less uh, uh, flexibly or more, more abstractly or more concretely. Some languages are kind of really difficult to, uh, to work with and they pose a lot of questions or a lot of um, uh, challenges for you. So uh, the example I, uh, I, I gave last year was um, if you go, um, so if you, uh, if you write uh, a statement like this, for example, one minus um, one minus one as a string. What will happen? What do you? So this is an expression. So this is an expression which I want to evaluate in some programming language. Uh, and for example, in C or C plus plus, that expression would not evaluate it. The compiler would complain that you know that expression is invalid, right? In some languages the compiler will not complain. And one of those languages is JavaScript, right? In JavaScript, uh, the, there is no compiler and the interpreter will say, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I can deal with that. So uh, what do you think will be the, you know, uh, the outcome of this, of this expression in JavaScript? It will be zero. Yes, so there is, uh, Oscar suggested that the outcome will be zero and it will indeed be zero. So knowing that JavaScript interprets that as an expression which evaluates this string to a numerical value and then subtract that numerical value from that, what would you expect if I said uh, this in JavaScript? So Oscar thinks it would be two. Some people think it will be 11. <laughs> so as you see, it's a bit of a messy situation, right? Um, if you follow the logic that, um, that this is converted to the type of the first uh, expression. So, so this is an expression which is composed of uh, two literals and the operation. And this literal, the first literal uh, is, um, integer right so it's an integer number and then the second literal is a string so beneath the scene javascript converts that to a uh, to an integer to a numerical value right and makes the operation so we read it from left to right and we say okay this one is the numerical literal 
then we have a kind of a numerical operation, and then we have the um, a string which we casting back to the numerical operation. So here we have similar situation. We have a numerical operation. We have a numerical um, a numerical literal numerical operation, and then again the string literal. Uh, but this time. JavaScript doesn't interpret this as a numerical operation. It interprets that as a string concatenation operation. And instead of casting this one to the numerical value, it casts this one to a string. So we end up with this, uh, with this being the, uh, the outcome, uh, which is kind of not logically following the first interpretation, right? Um, so some languages, JavaScript, being the best example, a bit messy in a sense that they have uh, some intricacies which you have to know and you have to understand to be able to kind of write effective code, right? Uh, and um, some languages and help you to express yourself in such a way that it's correct and they will spot some uh, um, violations of the, you know, agreed semantics. Uh, you know, th this ambiguity, like, uh, you know, me saying, uh, me saying one plus and then something, uh, this ambiguity of what I mean and what is meant by particular symbols, right? So for example, if I do, uh, if I do this and if I do this, and they have a different rules of interpreting what the literals are and what the operations are, uh, they kind of add a burden to you. Uh, if, if they are both illegal in a language like C++, then you don't deal with these intricacies. Like they are all illegal. The compiler will say, yeah, well, I don't know what you mean. Like, what do you mean? What do you want to do here? Do you want to cast this to a number? Then cast it. If, do you want to cast this to a string? Then, then make it a string. Right, so the compiler doesn't make decisions for you. The compiler complains that you're not precise enough, and this lack of precision sometimes is desirable uh, because you you can use this lack of precision in some uh, scripting languages to express uh, kind of a meta programming constructs, uh, and in languages which are very strict, like you know C, it's very hard to to express certain generic things because the compiler requires you to be very precise. So that means some type, some uh, uh, some coding is is very tedious because you have to be very precise of what you want. Uh, so there are plat, you know, benefits and um, uh, disadvantages. I'm not saying you know JavaScript is all wrong. Uh, JavaScript has its uses and it has uh, shown to be very popular for some small scripting uh, applications and even like larger pro projects being written in it. But it is not designed to be used in a very complex uh, multi-generational, uh, multi-developer projects because this ambiguity will bite you. It will cost you in maintenance and in bugs which are kind of are creeping in. Um, okay, so I will try not to rant so much. So what programming languages do you know so far? So Frederick says, I prefer explicit coercions. Yes, we, I'm not, not, I shouldn't say we, but most programmers uh, prefer explicit coercions and some type safety, which is guaranteed by the type system and by the compiler. Um, all right, so we have Python, uh, we have C, C++. Those are the usual suspects. We have Lua. Uh, C sharp, yes, great. Um, what else do we have? Yeah, you could program in the command line interface of Linux. We have Kotlin. I don't think I have Kotlin. Yeah, that's a good point. We should include Kotlin. Uh, Kotlin is becoming de facto a uh, superset of Java. So if, once you start doing Kotlin, you most people tend not to like Java anymore. They prefer to do Kotlin actually. Uh, but yeah, Golang, Haskell, great. So I think we have most of languages like R. Yeah, R is not really a programming language, but you can uh, do programming in R too. Um, 
All right, so let's see. Let's see how well you know those languages. So I don't have all of them, but I have some. So for which language is that? Yeah, Python, very nice. Good. So, in which languages you can write hello world in? All of you should now know how to do it in Python because it was on the previous slide. <laughs> uh, and then I don't have Kotlin, so I should add Kotlin there. Um, So majority of people know, really know C++. If you cannot do hello world, then you don't really know Golang or Haskell, right? Yeah. Ah, uh, you cannot do multi-choice. Oh, crap. That's uh, my mistake then. Okay, sorry for that. I thought it was allowing you to do multiple, uh, multiple choices. All right, then in that case, um, it's natural that your first choice is C++, but it indicates that you kind of finished uh, through this course. All right, so the second problem is the dining philosopher's problem. Um, the problem is well um, established toy problem in computer science, and it demonstrates the use of resources and pro problems of starvation and problem of um, um, scheduling. So the problem is basically you have some philosophers sitting around the table, they have plates for eating, so they need food to, to survive, but they also need to spend time thinking. So when they are thinking, they are not eating, but they when they are eating, then they need two forks. Uh, so if this guy is eating, then it will occupy those two forks, and that means this guy and this guy cannot eat because they cannot get a handle of two forks. Uh, and then you have some uh, situations where a given philosopher can be a very quick thinker. So he eats for a long time and then for a very short time he thinks and then he starts eating again. So he releases the forks for a very short time, which might not be enough for these guys to grab the fork, especially if uh, these two guys are also you know, eating in the meantime. Uh, so this guy getting a hold of those two forks might be kind of hard. So then you have a problem of starvation. So the, these two or one of them might never kind of get a handle of, uh, of two forks and, and, and so on. So this is kind of a, a demo problem, uh, which is often used as an example for concurrent programming. Uh, so the question is how many programming languages can you do that in? Uh, and if you cannot do multi, um uh, multi choice then that sucks as well yeah only one choice and you cannot do multiple submissions right yeah so pick the one which you would be most comfortably doing it in yeah one submission that's my ap apologies for that Yeah, so uh, some of you probably did it in operating systems uh, using uh, C or, or some threading. C++ is also nice. So there is, um, there is a new question. Um, if you think about all programming languages that you've heard of or know, what would be the best programming language to do the dining philosopher's problem in? What do you think? Yeah, so if you can do it in C, of course, you can do it in C++, uh, but what would be the, um, the programming language that you think is uh, Dining Philosophers is the prime hello world example for that programming language? Yeah, someone is trolling the the mentimeter a little bit 
So what would be the, like you use the Zoom uh, chat to answer, what would be the characteristics of a programming language that is best suited for that, for this particular problem? So, so if, if, if let, let's say someone said assembly, okay? Uh, why, why assembly would be the best language for that? Yeah, Oscar, very, very good. So a uh, language which has a very easy way of expressing concurrency, right? Uh, so state and concurrency would be the, um, the best way to, to do that. And like out of those languages, um, Rust and Haskell's are kind of not really best in expressing concurrency. Like you have to use like uh, libraries to express uh, concurrency. Golang has concurrency built in into the language itself. So out of the list here, Golang would be sort of the, the you know, uh, probably the, the best one. Another candidate is C++, although there is a big difference between expressing concurrency in Golang and in C++. The C++ concurrency is much more low level. You have to deal with semaphores, with locks, with, uh, you know, uh, concurrent access yourself. Whereas with Golang, you can do a little bit more high level. You can use uh, uh, concurrency um, constructs, right? But yeah, you could use C-sharp. So C-sharp is also um, uh, a candidate and you can use some asynchronous tasks uh, metaphors. So it would be a little bit better than C++ uh, in terms of abstraction, but kind of a similar level. Um, so the language which I was sort of looking for is uh, Erlang. So I don't know if you've heard of that, you know, uh, Swedish language, um, Erlang. But in like whoever is using Erlang to, to, to teach or to learn, uh, Dining Philosophers is the prime kind of hello world example. Uh, it is because Erlang not only has concurrency constructs, it also has a concept of an agent, which is like a self-contained process which communicates with the outside world uh, and they can be modeled as those philosophers. So the resources, the forks can be very naturally modeled in Erlang and then the philosophers can be really naturally modeled using the kind of actor uh, slash agent uh, metaphors of Erlang itself. And then doing all the coding of the synchronization and the syn um, concurrency is very nice. So it's very, um, uh, it, it, it has a very, very nice uh, mechanisms for dealing with concurrency. And this is why it was primarily used for telecommunication uh, software for managing like uh, switches and the, the big telco uh, software for uh, managing the, the various concurrent things which happen in the, you know, uh, telephony networks. All right, so Erlang didn't, we, we didn't mention Erlang before, but it, it is nice language to, to know about, especially given that, for example, Golang is taking some metaphors and some ideas from Erlang as well. So if you were to rate your skills um, in C11, what would you think? Yeah, some of you might be hackers. I haven't worked so much with the modern C, to be honest. I worked quite a lot with the previous um, C releases and I, I was uh, quite good, but uh, with the modern one, I, I know some things became a bit easier. So it became quite a nice, nice language. Um, uh, cool. So, so most of you say, um, yeah, it kind of follows a, a, a really bell, bell curve distribution. So either um, medium or basic is the kind of a majority. So let's see how you're dealing with a, a, a bit more tricky question. So a more tricky question is, C11 has introduced the following. Atomics, multi-threading, 
multi-threading anatomics, collections, garbage collector, or generics. Yeah, very nice. So uh, it sort of follows uh, the previous distribution. So most people are here, even though those two are not correct because this one is correct, they are partially correct, right? Because it did introduce atomics and it did introduce multi-threading, but it introduced both. Um, and that relates a little bit to the previous dining philosophers because you know C was not that great to do dining philosophers in, but now with C11, it's a little bit easier. It's a little bit better uh, because you do have some uh, more abstractions for multi-threading and atomics. Um, all right, uh, sounds good. So let's do let's do a review. How you doing so far? So Anita is leading the pack. Fantastic. So let's do um, let's do two more, and then we'll have a break. So um, what do you think programming? What what programming paradigms do you know? So what programming paradigms do you know and what programming paradigms do you know of? So all of you knows object-oriented because that's what you have covered so far. Um, Data-oriented is interesting, functional. So machine code, what, what is machine code? What, what paradigm that, that is an example of? Yeah, imperative. So imperative, um, yeah, machine code kind of fits into the imperative paradigm. Imperative paradigm is quite broad. Um, not fictional, functional. So we will cover quite a number uh, in this um, in this uh, course. Uh, we will cover quite a lot of paradigms, and we will cover quite a lot of terminology for programming and programming languages. So let let's do this one, and then we'll have a break, right? So um, in Programming languages, we often say this is a scripting language and this one is a programming language. Uh, can you give me examples of um, in chat of scripting languages that you know of? Lua, yeah. So scripting. Scripting examples, JavaScript. It has a script in the name, so it has to be a scripting language, right? PHP, Python, Ruby, Bash, okay, CoffeeScript. Okay, let's have Kotlin. So let's have Bash here. Uh, let's have Kotlin. So, uh, Lua, we let's have it here a little bit. Okay, so um, R definitely here. Okay, so JavaScript, CoffeeScript, Bash, R designed as scripting languages. They were designed to be as scripting languages. They can be used for programming, of course, like uh, Visual Studio code is written in JavaScript. It's a, you know, quite a complex, big pro pro program. Uh, so you could say, yeah, you know, JavaScript can be programming language, uh, but not really. Um, Lua, yeah, that is also designed to be a, a scripting language. Uh, PHP was also designed as a scripting language, so was Python. Uh, Ruby was designed to be a programming language for web 
uh, frameworks for, for a web uh, framework like Ruby on Rails was the prime example of, of the uh, of the use case for Ruby. Uh, Kotlin was also designed as a programming language as a superset of Java, right? Superset of Java. Um, so let's, yeah, I would say they kind of borderline, but maybe they are more on a programming side, right? Programming, programming language. So give me, um, yeah, VB script also definitely here. Uh, uh, give me some examples that are definitely programming languages. C++, C, what else? F sharp, Rust, Haskell, C sharp, yeah, C sharp, sharp, Cobol. Visual Basic Java. So yeah, if we say Java, Visual Basic, uh, I would say Visual Basic is kind of a borderline. Visual Basic. Um, it was kind of um, um, mostly for programming, programming logic in MS Office, right? Um, it, it was kind of like a scripting language for the office package. Uh, you could program uh, bigger applications with it, but it doesn't like, you know, same, same as with all those guys. Like you can write quite a big projects in Python as well, right? Um, Solidity is a programming language, yeah. So um, yeah, Solidity might be a little bit kind of borderline. So the... The, the distinction between scripting and programming is not very well defined. So some languages historically were designed to be scripting like Python. Python was designed as a, you know, better bash, right? So it was designed to be kind of a much more powerful scripting language such that instead of doing your bash scripts and something that is a little bit ugly, uh, you know, I'm not sure what you think about programming in bash, but it, it is a bit awkward, right? Uh, you could do those little programs in Python and then run them in your command line. Uh, so Python was designed to be kind of a, a better, better structured bash. And then, and then it grew. They went through various iterations. They added new features. They added things. And it's sort of a lot of people consider Python as a programming language, right? Uh, so, but... Um, Nobody will really say Bash is a programming language. So some things that started as scripting stayed scripting, and some things that started as scripting were kind of migrating towards programming. But historically, all those programming languages are strongly typed, uh, compiled, um, and they have a certain features that, uh, yeah, that's including, including these. Um, and these ones are kind of more dynamic, dynamic typed, uh, flexible type system. Uh, they are more kind of expressive, like as we were showing with uh, JavaScript. So there is a spectrum and the clear cut cutting point is not really well defined, but you know, as a programmer, you will have kind of a feel of, of where, uh, where you want to be and what is kind of suitable. The, the point being here is that for large projects, for kind of, um, uh, programming more complex things, we tend to be on that side of the spectrum because the type system and the enforcement of certain rules help us to deal with complexity. Whereas when we're doing some single file, single script, like, you know, I'm, I want to build the ML model, uh, I want to interact with TensorFlow, would I use a heavy duty, heavy type system? No, it's like a short, it might be 50 lines of code. I will be much more expressive. It, it would be much more expressive and easier to do it in one of those uh, because of the, of the nature of the script. Uh, Solidity is a, a little bit tricky because we start building bigger things with it, but originally it also started a little bit like a scripting for smart contracts. So the smart contracts were not very big. Uh, they were not very complex. And Solidity, which is kind of derived from um, uh, JavaScript, 
is sort of in a similar fashion, but it has more strict type system. So the type system is much more strict um, than, um, sorry, more strict than JavaScript. Yeah. So I also think it's a little bit more on that side of the spectrum. All right, so let's quickly move on. I'm like dragging the break too much. So we mentioned statically typed versus dynamically typed, right? So these ones are all statically typed. Uh, Ruby, dynamically typed. Solidity, statically typed. Uh, Python, Lua, R, all those uh, dynamically typed, right? So you can see that same as this spectrum, this is sort of similar. We have more dynamic, um, I mean, uh, reverse. We have more statically typed programming languages and more uh, dynamically typed scripting, right? Um, so give me an example of a language with or without type inference. So with type inference, without. Just one example. And um, uh, JavaScript. Mm. All right, so. Yeah, that's a little bit tricky then. So with Haskell, okay, we come back to this one. Uh, Haskell is with type. Uh, without is um, C, okay. So C plus plus was without uh, until C C plus plus eleven, and then there is some minimal type inference, right? Um, yeah, so let's come back to that. Uh, Python, uh, all the dynamic, dynamically type languages, they don't really have type system in a sense of you knowing what exactly the type of the variable is. So if I have a function in Python and the function takes A, uh, as a as a parameter, what is that type? What is the type of A? Well, it's dynamic. There is no fixed type attached to it, right? Uh, it's not a statically typed language. So the of course the runtime system has to work out what, what you know what's the placeholder for what is being passed to to my function. So if I have some you know some function f which takes A as a parameter. Uh, uh, you know, the, the interpreter will have to work out what A is. Is A a number or A is a string? But when I'm calling it, I can call it, uh, I can call it with one or I can call it with, uh, you know, with a string. Uh, I don't say what the type is. And at the time of, of building it, there is no type inference as such, right? Um, okay, so let's move on quickly. Uh, declarative versus imperative. Um, that's a little bit more tricky, uh, but we have languages which are, again, th th there is a bit of a spectrum. Uh, in some languages, you cannot really uh, declaratively express anything. You have to be very uh, verbose, uh, very imperative. Uh, but in some languages, even though most of the time you're very imperative, you may have some uh, uh, features of the language which allow you to be declarative, right? Um, and then we have compiled versus interpreted versus compiled into the bytecode. Uh, so yeah, Oscar, very good. So for example, SQL is a, a great example of a purely declarative language where you express what you want, but you don't express how. Uh, in Haskell, it's in, in some situations is the same. Um, so the compiled versus interpreted versus bytecode interpreted, that's often also something which differentiates programming languages versus scripting. Uh, Python historically was interpreted, uh, but you know some of the modern Python can be compiled into the bytecode and then you have a just-in-time compiler, which will comp compile it to machine code. So you have those kind of a towers of uh, 
um, abstractions. Uh, Java was uh, and is a very good example of that .NET platform as well. So you have a dot .NET platform or JVM, which allows you to do everything on a kind of a bytecode level. And that is just in time compiled to a machine code. And then on top of that, you're building your software using those kind of uh, languages, which are not compiled directly to machine code, but compiled to this kind of uh, uh, intermediary layer. Uh, some languages are compiled directly to the machine code, like, you know, like Haskell uh, or Rust or C++, C. Uh, some languages are having this kind of intermediate layer, like Kotlin, Java, uh, Ruby. Um, <coughs> okay, uh, we have um, uh, languages which are lazy. Um, so, any examples of... Um, can you do, um, yeah, so do, do you know any language that you can express something lazily? Lazy Haskell, Python, Rust. So not many. Right, uh, laziness is a kind of a nice feature, but it's a little bit tricky to deal with it. Uh, and there you need a certain kind of language support. Uh, you cannot do really lazy things in languages like C, C++, C Sharp. Uh, there are some uh, support for uh, lazy collections um, in Java. Uh, so some languages are trying to kind of uh, provide some, some features like this, uh, but th that's not that common. Um, this point, uh, rich versus limited standard library, that's, we will come back to that. Uh, th this is like a very important discussion for language design. And uh, that's what uh, Rust versus Golang differs, right? So the Rust philosophy and Golang philosophy uh, to the standard library uh, differ. Uh, Rust is an example of a very limited and Golang is an example of a very rich uh, standard library. Um, and they, therefore you have certain advantages and disadvantages of, of the choice, but we will come back to that a, a little bit later. Um, and then we have uh, languages that have, um, yeah, I have two points. So with and without memory safety and with and without garbage collector. So all dynamically typed languages, they have garbage collector built in. Um, some languages like uh, Java and, and Ruby and Kotlin, uh, they are also having a garbage collector built-in. Uh, languages like um, uh, C++ and C, to some extent C Sharp, uh, Rust, they don't. Uh, Haskell has. Um, so there is this concept of memory safety and garbage collector. So if you have a garbage collector in the language, then it is by default memory safe. But so, so all garbage collected languages are memory safe. Um, can you give me an example of a language that is memory safe, but doesn't have a garbage collector? Rust, perfect. So Rust is quite unique, right? If you think about it. Rust is an, a language which doesn't have a garbage collector, but provides memory safety. So it is a very unique value proposition, right? Uh, we don't have many of those. Um, okay, let's have a break. I dragged the break for too long. Uh, apologies for that. So let's have a 12 minutes break and we reconvene at uh, 1.30. All right. So let's do timer. And we'll go for 12 minutes, no, 12 hours, 12 minutes.
Okay, let me check something. <clears throat> so Oh, come on. Yeah, I don't think Christopher updated the Zoom link yet. So yeah, we will do that after his lecture. Okay, so let's um, let's continue with our discussion. Uh, okay, so I will check. Thanks, Aspen. Um, let's continue with our discussion about terminology. Why is the terminology important? Well, the terminology is important because to compare languages and to discuss why there are some advantages and disadvantages of some languages or why something was chosen, you kind of need to use this type of vocabulary. Uh, we had a feedback for the bachelor thesis um, uh, graders for the externals. And they said that uh, when you're writing your projects and when you're writing your, um, your bachelor thesis in particular, you often make ad hoc decisions. You say, oh, we've used Golang for our project because we knew it, or we knew it from a cloud course. Um, well, you know, that, that's very uh, in, inappropriate way of uh, making a choice. You should say we chose, you know, Golang because of its rich standard library or because of its uh, convenient concurrency uh, primitives or something like this. So, in, you know, try to use the, the kind of the vocabulary of what was suited for the job. And then you make your argument to sound much more professional uh, and the graders will kind of like you for it. Right. Uh, so don't. Uh, uh, <laughs> Don't make kind of ad hoc choices, even though you have a gut feeling, yeah, that's a good tool for a job. You try to motivate why, right? Um, okay, so then we have another uh, couple of uh, term terms. So we have um, encapsulation. Uh, that's a big one. So we have gone from machine programming, which didn't have any encapsulation whatsoever, to programming languages like you know Haskell, which have a very robust type system and very robust way of encapsulating uh, not only behavior, but also like a data structures or, or type systems, such that you kind of hide the complexity of what you don't want to expose to outside kind of in, internally. Uh, and that's that can be, and you know, you, you know probably term encapsulation from object-oriented programming where you encapsulate the state of the object inside the object and you only expose the kind of the methods to manipulate the state. But that's a very narrow way of, of um, describing it. You can have encapsulation in a form of uh, uh, scoping rules and like some, uh, some things, um, let me quick that and show you. So for example, in Golang, you can have, uh, and, and in JavaScript as well, you can have functions. Uh, so I can have a function f, and inside my function f, I can declare a new function, uh, func g, which does something. And then this function g lives only in, in the scope of function f. It's not visible anywhere outside. Uh, and that kind of encapsulates my uh, yeah, the visibility or the, the logic of what G can do only within the scope of, of F. And that's kind of a very neat example of encapsulation, which a lot of uh, programming languages cannot do. Like uh, 
you cannot really achieve this type of encapsulation in, uh, in C++, but you have other forms of encapsulation. Uh, so encapsulation is, is important and it allows you to deal uh, with complexity by hiding some of the things behind the API or behind the interface uh, and then making things easier, like to look easier from outside. Um, of course, type, type systems, um, th this is important. And again, in Haskell, we have uh, those algebraic data types, uh, which are you know, very mathematically sound. Uh, and all the other programming languages are kind of benefiting from some of that, but not implementing it fully. Uh, so the, the expressiveness and how rich the type system is also uh, talks, um, uh, also kind of expresses the, the strengths or weaknesses on the other hand of a programming language. Um, object versus instance. I think you also covered that in object-oriented programming. So you know the, uh, the, um, you know, the, the term object and the term instance are kind of used in uh, Java or in C++ interchangeably. Uh, but in languages such as JavaScript, uh, they're not treated interchangeably anymore, right? Uh, you have kind of a prototype uh, and you can clone the, the, uh, the object using this sort of a prototype based uh, approach. Uh, and there is a bit of a difference of the usage or the, the kind of the meaning of what uh, an object and an and instance is. Like uh, object is um, an instance of a type in object-oriented programming, which kind of instance, instantiates the, the particular type uh, like in C++, which represents th this behavior plus state. Um, but an instance can be, it's, it's a more broader term. Uh, it can be, um, for example, a generic function, which has a particular instance for that particular type, uh, which has been instantiated for, right? So a function can be an instance of something. So object is an instance of a type, but an instance is kind of a more generic term. Um, right, next one. We have, you know, quite a lot uh, here to go through. So class, uh, again, it relates to the, um, to the type system and object-oriented programming, but we also have um, sort of, um, yeah, let's, let's scroll. Um, yeah, I will come back to the class. So then we have pointers versus references. Um, this is also important. You have covered it in C uh, and C++. Uh, so especially with the modern C++, we tend not to deal with pointers directly. We tend to deal with references instead. Uh, some uh, of the people who come from Java or from um, Python <laughs> or other dynamic languages, they never really deal with pointers. Uh, when we will be doing Golang, uh, you will learn that Golang reintroduced kind of a pointer uh, concept to the language, but uh, it, it, is, um, it doesn't have like the pointer arithmetic like in C, but it has kind of a some semantic uh, meaning of uh, uh, pointing to a memory location and then being able to do something there. Uh, then we have variables versus constants. We can have mutable or immutable variables. Some modern programming languages like uh, Rust thought the idea of having uh, immutable variables is good. Uh, some languages don't have it. Like uh, in uh, some languages, you have variables and constants. So immutability is only done through constants. But sometimes you want to have an immu immutable variable, right? It allows you to deal with something which happens on the runtime and then be become kind of immutable. Uh, with constants, yeah, the, the idea is that you have it sort of in the, uh, on the entry, on the compile time. Um, literals and um, expressions, I think I have it later. So literal, uh, the way, you deal with literals in the language is also very important. So for example, in some languages, you are allowed to declare your own literals. Um, so all, you know, from the programming languages that you typically deal with so far, uh, you have literals for uh, numbers, right? So you have 
integer literal or float literal, uh, you may have a character, right? So a character is like, this is a literal for a character A. This is a literal for the floating point number. Uh, and this is a literal for an integer or a byte. Uh, we don't know exactly, like you may have some uh, pipe polymorphism on the literals. Um, and then can you express an object as a literal? Uh, well, in Java, you cannot, but in JavaScript, you can. So in JavaScript, I can have kind of a notation like this. And I can say um, I can say something like this, and that is a literal for a struct which has a field a of value one, uh, and I can have languages which have more um, powerful ways of expressing literals, and some which don't. Uh, in some, like in Ruby, you can or some some other dynamic ones, uh, you can de declare your own literal uh, to have a particular particular type. And for example, you can declare a literal, which is a currency, and then you can attach what currency that literal is for. So this, for example, can be declared as a legal literal, and then you can do operations on uh, valid literals, for example, like this. Uh, but if you try to do, um, try to do something like this, then uh, you may have to have a conversion rules because that's a completely different type of a literal to this one. Uh, and then it allows you to kind of express a little bit more high level concepts such as like complex numbers or currencies and so on and have kind of a, a, a neat way of expressing it directly in code. Uh, again, in some, uh, I think in modern C++, you can also introduce uh, literal types, like uh, user-defined ones, but uh, in some languages, you cannot do that. <clears throat> then we have a uh, concept of a pure function. Um, so we have um, functions such as, um, so if I have a function, so again, using a Golang notation, if I have a function f, and the function f takes some uh, input uh, and produces some output. Um, if that function doesn't take anything from the outside world and always producing the same output uh, for the same input, uh, then it's a pure function, right? Uh, because it doesn't mutate anything uh, outside itself. Um, and for a given input, it, it is always the same uh, con you know, concrete output. So in my Pure function is kind of the same as in mathematics. Uh, and mathematical function is kind of the same. It, it maps the input domain into the output domain. Uh, and then impure functions are the ones which mutate some external state or use some external state to produce the output, such that for the same input, the output might be different depending on the state of the world outside of the function, right? Uh, why, why we make this distinction and why, for example, C++ introduced the pure um, keyword to the language? Well, because dealing with pure functions is much easier in terms of analysis compared to analysis of impure functions. Um, pure functions allow you to predict what are the dependencies and what will happen. And you can kind of uh, pre-calculate certain things while uh, the, the processing is happening somewhere else uh, because pure functions don't mutate the state. So you can do those calculations concurrently in, in parallel. Um, we will talk more about this later in the course, of course, as well. Uh, and then, yes, this is the, the complementary concept. So if the function doesn't have side effects, then it's a pure function. If the function has mutate something outside uh, its own um, structure, then the function has side effects and then it's, it cannot be pure. So for example, if I have, um, if I, you could say, well, I have a function f um, which uh, prints. So again, I'm using a Golang notation. Uh, so print line, I'm printing something, right? So then you could say, oh, f is pure because it doesn't use anything from outside and it doesn't like influences anything from the outside, but that's not entirely true. It prints something to the terminal, right? And this is a side effect, which once happened, I, um, it has an effect of the, on the outside world, right? So I owe, um, 
NAIO op operation is kind of a, an example of a side effect because it has some kind of influence on the, on the terminal. So even though this function doesn't return anything and doesn't take anything as an argument, it's not pure because it manipulates something in the outside world. And in this case, the, the terminal window. Um, Okay, and then we have concurrency versus parallelism. Uh, this one is an important one. Uh, we will talk a little bit more about it later as well. Um, what is the main difference between concurrency and parallelism? Anyone? Can I can I have uh, yeah parallelism is that yeah so parallelism is when uh, two processes actually run at the same time versus concurrency where you have things appear to be happening at the same time but they can physically actually run on the single CPU right so you can have um, can have con concurrency on a single CPU, uh, but I cannot have parallelism on a single CPU. Um, yeah, so concurrency is kind of like multitasking, uh, such that you are doing some sort of a time slicing or something on the single resource, but you are kind of achieving the uh, multiple things sort of concurrently. Uh, parallelism is when you have multiple uh, multiple CPUs or processing units, if it's like you know GPU, and then they actually work physically at the same time. Um, so then the multiple processes are happening together, like at the same time. That's what uh, uh, parallelism is. Parallelism. Okay, so um, let's do, uh, yeah, exactly. So that's what I was saying that we will come back to class. Uh, the concept of a class is a little bit tricky. So if you come from Java or uh, Java, so coming from Java or uh, C++ background, you have kind of a natural sense of what class is. And you basically see kind of a class as a type um, and it has uh, a particular state. So attribute, attributes or member, member variables um, and it has some kind of behavior, right? Um, like some methods, uh, but that's not necessarily how all programming languages use the term class. Um, it, it is a little bit uh, tricky. So uh, especially with Rust and Haskell and C++, the concept of, a tra of the trait class and uh, meta classes, it's a little bit um, uh, mixed up and you need to get a little bit of an intuition of what is meant in a different context. Uh, we, will, we will talk more about it later on uh, in the course, but those are kind of a terms which are are used for more um, advanced programming and for metaprogramming. Uh, inheritance, yes, that one is a bit easier. Uh, with C++ and with some uh, object-oriented programming, you've been exposed to single uh, parent inheritance or multiple parent inheritance. Uh, and you have kind of intuitions of what inheritance is and what it is useful for. Um, since object-oriented programming was invented, there has been sort of a steady criticism of inheritance actually. Uh, so even though it was claimed initially that inheritance is the best thing ever happening to programming, uh, modern analysis and modern kind of analysis of uh, complexity or in, in software suggests that we tend not to benefit so much from inheritance, but rather from delegation and delegation based models of structuring the programs tend to be more robust, more uh, extendable, and easier to maintain than the ones which are based on our deep inheritance hierarchies. So 
modern software, you, you will observe that they tend not to have a very deep inheritance hierarchies. They will be inheritance, of course, it's a very useful concept to abstract certain behavior kind of in a base class and then have some um, more specialized, specialized um, instantiations. But we are kind of diverting from pure, long, uh, big uh, hierarchies more towards uh, delegation instead, because it's more robust. And, and as I said, it's more easy to maintain. And then generics, that's another kind of a hot topic. Um, okay, so what is delegation? Yeah, delegation is instead of doing inheritance, you are delegating some behavior to a common instance such that you can again achieve, um, uh, instead of repeating yourself, you kind of are delegating to some central point which does what you need to, to achieve. So I will explain it in the, in the next sessions when we will be discussing that in, in Golang. Because Golang doesn't have, uh, actually Golang doesn't have inheritance. Most of the inheritance-like behaviors are achieved through delegation. So you, you will see uh, what is uh, the inheritance versus delegation versus composition. Uh, so we will come back to those uh, three terms. Um, uh, later, uh, uh, not, probably not on Wednesday, but on Monday next week. Great, so let's uh, steal more. Okay, so uh, in terms of programming languages, what we often do is we often analyze how certain things are done. Uh, and we compare some of the features of the language uh, by using the kind of the terminology of the programming uh, itself. So we have cons constructs like arithmetic operations. We have um, logic operations. Th those are, you know, um, trivial. Like you, you know that for all the programming languages that you've been using so far. Uh, we have control flow operations. So, for example, in how many ways can you do a loop in C or C++? Well, there are multiple ways of doing loops, uh, including go to statements, right? Um, but in Golang, for example, you only have one for, for statement, and that's the only way you can do kind of loops. Um, and you can express different um, variations of looping through that single construct. So that's why we say, for example, that Golang is simple because it minimized like its instruction set. Um, then we have expression, uh, and then we have statements, which is a uh, different um, different construct. So what what is different between a statement and uh, versus expression? Um, so if I say um, if I say something something equals two plus two, right? The two plus two is an expression. Uh, it will be evaluated to a value. Uh, so every expression is evaluated to a value. But if I say uh, in A, that is a statement. And the statement is not evaluated to a value. A statement makes something in the space of the program, but it's not evaluated to a, to a value at the end of the day, right? It, it, you cannot ask what is the type of that because of that, because that is not an expression, that is a statement. Uh, so same with when um, when you, for example, do a for loop, right? So in C++, if I do a for loop and I have some, you know, um, some uh, conditions here, and then I'm, I'm doing the for loop, then this is a statement, but it's not an expression. In some programming languages, this is an expression as well. And what it means is that I can assign it because it will evaluate to a value, I can assign it to something, right? I can do this. So I can say something like this. If for loops are expressions, but if for loops are not expressions, if for loops are only statements, I cannot do this. Uh, so that limits some of the expressiveness of the language, depending how the language designers decided to deal with expressions uh, versus statements. Um, we will compare it between the some of the languages that we uh, we will work with. And then polymorphism or polymorphic types. Again, that's a more advanced topic. We will come back to that uh, later on, although we will cover it next week when we talk a little bit about polymorphic functions in Golang. 
Okay, I am as always talking too much. So what we will cover in this course? Uh, let's have a quick uh, recap. So one language that you will learn this semester is Golang. And how many languages can you learn in a semester? Well, I think you can learn one. And that one will be Golang. Uh, the other languages we will introduce this semester, you will not really learn, but you will learn about. Uh, and you will have kind of a background of how to continue learning those languages, but you will need to go beyond that semester. Uh, we cannot, and you cannot really learn many languages in the at the same time, uh, but you can get an exposure and we can kind of uh, speed up some of your learning such that it will become easier. So one of the languages that you will learn this semester is Golang. Uh, it's a contemporary C. It's very easy to learn. You can effectively, knowing C++ or, or having kind of a programming background, you can literally learn it in about a week. Uh, you can be very efficient in, in about week time. Um, it's very easy to use, but because it's so easy, that means some things are a little bit tedious. And one of those tedious things is, for example, error handling uh, or generics, which Golang lacks. Um, so you will learn that it's great, but it, it has some little things that are a little bit inconvenient. Uh, it's great for networking. Uh, it's great for expressing concurrency. And it plays really well with Docker and with the cloud course. Uh, and it's really good for doing a large project builds because it's extremely fast in, in compiling like large, large projects. Um, all right, so what's, what else? Uh, you will get a little bit of an exposure to Rust. Uh, Rust is a very good alternative to C++. It is a harder language. It's a harder language to learn. It feels quite modern. Uh, it is very good for embedded systems. Uh, it's very expressive. It's more expressive than, um, than C++, but it's not as expressive as Haskell. Uh, Haskell is more expressive than Rust. And Rust borrows some of the constructs and concepts from Haskell. So Rust kind of is heavily inspired by what Haskell has to have kind of a minimal subset that they can support to be similar to, to Haskell. Uh, and you, you will probably use it if you're doing some uh, mobile cross-platform or embedded uh, projects, or if you're doing something with security or with financial projects or something that relies heavily on uh, uh, on memory safety, so to say. All right, and then the main language that we will use in this course is Haskell. Uh, it is kind of a grandfather of many programming languages. Uh, a lot of features in many existing programming languages have been inspired or borrowed from Haskell. Um, it will challenge you. Uh, if you haven't been programming in Haskell before, it helps to kind of forget a little bit of what you've learned so far. Um, and it will make you a better programmer because you will be exposed to slightly different way of thinking and being a little bit more open-minded about different possibilities of how you can express complex problems. Uh, it's very expressive. Uh, and because it's so expressive, it takes very long time to learn it. Um, so I think you need to spend at least three years uh, doing programming in Haskell to feel comfortable. Uh, so this, this semester, you will feel comfortable with the material that we have, but it will not make you a very good Haskell programmer. It's kind of an ongoing journey. Um, and it's very good for very large and complex problems uh, because it deals with complexity really well. Um, all right, so um, a little bit about Haskell. It's functional, it's pure, it has very concise notation. It's a little bit academic because it comes from academia, uh, but it is being used in a, a commercial system and commercial systems and it's quite difficult. Uh, because we're running out of time and I have a couple of more quizzes, let's go quickly through the quizzes. So each is 15 seconds and I think you should, we should be able to kind of wrap it up in maybe two minutes or three minutes. So Haskell, Rust, and Go, um, are they compiled languages or interpreted? Easy question. Mm. 
they are all compiled. So Haskell, Rust, and Golang are all compiled languages, and they are all compiled to native code, not to bytecode. OK, it turned out not to be that easy. Half of you got it wrong. All right. We have some shuffling on the leaderboard a little bit. Okay, so three more questions. Again, with that triple, they are dynamic languages, strictly typed, or some are dynamic, some are strictly typed. They are all strictly typed. Um, again, it turned out to be a harder question than I thought. All right, next one. So about the type inference. Yeah, type inference was a little bit uh, difficult topic. So type inference is for the compiler to work out precisely what type an expression has uh, before it, it is being used. So all of them have type inference, although uh, Golang and Rust don't have as much type inference as Haskell. So Haskell has the most, uh, but all of them have some form of uh, type inference. All right, two more questions. All right, so back to C, C++ world. That should be easy then. So how about C, C++? Uh, that is, a, that I gave the answer to that one earlier, so. Notice that C++ XX, right? So we're going for, for 11. Yeah, that's correct. So C++ XX has some form of type inference. Uh, C doesn't have it. Uh, maybe they will add it later, uh, but so far that's the case. Fantastic. So we have one more question. It's about C++. Oh yeah, that's a hard topic as well. So uh, function polymorphism. Um, you will probably be guessing now if you haven't worked with that before. Uh, we will talk more about function polymorphism in the uh, next week when we talk about Golang. So it is true that uh, in C++ you do have uh, functional polymorphism. So you can use exactly the same function for different type of parameters that you pass to it. Uh, depending on the language power, uh, some languages allow you to do this, some don't. Uh, and then some languages allow you to also do that for the return type. So for example, in Java, you have function polymorphism on the inputs, but not on the output. Uh, whereas in, uh, because of templates and, and so on in C++, you can do that uh, for inputs and outputs. And in uh, some languages, you can do that for both. Uh, but in some, you can only do that for inputs. Great. So thank you very much. Um, this is the final. Yeah, so Anita has been climbing back a little bit, but uh, we have... The winner. Nice. All right. So um, sorry for going a little bit over time. Um, congratulations to those who scored well. Uh, we, um, if you have any questions, uh, you can um, you can ping me on Discord. And as I said, uh, at three o'clock, three fifteen. Uh, we will meet again uh, for the cloud course. You, you, uh, Christopher will be leading this one. And then on Wednesday, we don't have a class at A15. 
we meet at uh, 10 15 or oh, 8 20 i should say uh, we meet at uh, 10 15 for the slot which will be for the cloud course and we will start uh, learning golang um, in the meantime i have posted some resources related to haskell uh, so if you uh, want you can start reading um, i don't know why the page is not refreshing but there is a uh, there is a book, uh, Learn Yourself Haskell, uh, and that one will be the book that we will use for the uh, for the course. Uh, and yeah, I don't know what is happening with the. Yeah, just check check the resources, uh, and you can do a little bit of uh, start. Uh, even though we will be you know dealing with the with Golang in the next two weeks, uh, you can start reading a little bit about Haskell, and then we will start Haskell after. You are familiar with Golang, and you kind of uh, continue Golang in the in the cloud course. So, if you have any questions for now, no, if no, um, yeah. So Haskell will be the main programming language in this course. Although we will make some references to Golang and to Rust but not as heavily. So you will be kind of required to learn, uh, in, in this course, you will be required to learn Haskell. In the cloud computing course, you will be required to be using Golang for some cloud computing concepts. Uh, so you effectively will learn two programming languages, uh, one in uh, cloud computing and one here. Uh, but in this course, we are a little bit more generic. And we don't, uh, because we don't deal with any particular domain, we have a little bit more space to focus on some programming aspects and how programming languages differ. So we will do some example comparisons between Rust, Golang, and, and Haskell. But the main language that I would like you to learn is Haskell, yeah. I will talk a little bit more about that um, uh, once we finish Golang. Um, of what what we will do um, in terms of the language acquisition. Any other questions? Okay, so um, thank you very much, and I will uh, I will see you in uh, in an hour, and then uh, we will meet again on Wednesday. Wednesday, ten fifteen. Thank you very much.